Hey folks, welcome to module four, engaging digital discussions. So we're at the midpoint in this Moodle, uh, in, in this large training around Moodle getting situated. Uh, the first two were really getting oriented and creating content for the course. The last one and this one are really thinking about ways of creating interactive experiences with students. Uh, and then we'll move into uh, things like assignments and feedback and grading and eventually digication. But at this point, this session is going to be focused on digital discussions and the first really uh, two-thirds of it is going to be talking about what do we mean when we uh, are dis are having discussions online like what is the purpose of that and then the last third is going to actually be building out a discussion in Moodle just to show you how it's done but it's really important in this first two-thirds to think about what are we doing in this space and that helps us then make the decisions as we're creating the tool itself. And that's something we've been doing throughout these modules of mixing a little, a bit of pedagogy with the actual tool. And I think that's an important piece uh, in all that we're doing as we're moving into Moodle. It's not just about the tool, but thinking about how and why we're using it and in what capacities. So in this, in this session, we are looking at discussions or digital discussions. And so what I want to emphasize here is that as we get to talking about it, we're looking at discussions in the digital realm. Um, so anytime you hear me talking about it, that's the default mechanism. I'm not thinking about face-to-face -face discussions. Those are important. Those are valuable. Those do happen in courses that do either meet face-to-face -face or via Zoom. But what I'm thinking about is discussions that happen within Moodle or the learning management system or that are asynchronous in nature. So in that context, I would love for people to kind of sit with and think about these types of questions just from the very get-go. What is a discussion and are there differences or different expectations when that discussion is part of a course? What are some of your most successful discussions that you have had in an online space? What do you think made them successful? And then finally, what does the ideal online discussion look like to you? How are you engaged with it? How are your students engaged with it? What is the end result of that discussion? So I want you to, you know, maybe pause the recording, just kind of sit and ponder and think about these ideas um, as a framework for where we go next. And where we're going next is to really talk about discussions as a tool in uh, in courses. And this can be for face-to-face -face courses, courses that meet virtually in, say, Zoom, or courses that are asynchronous, where they'd never meet at the same time or in the same medium like Zoom, but that students kind of do a bit of self-directed learning guided by the instructor's um, structuring of a place like Moodle. So when we think about discussions like that or across those spaces, I think digital discussions can in you know in many ways should have a robust or can be robust features of any course. Um, I've used them in my face-to-face, -face, in my synchronous and asynchronous courses. Doesn't mean they always have to be there, but you generally do want to think about are there opportunities um, to use them. And you can even if you're you know if you are meeting synchronously face-to-face, -face, you can use them as ways of getting warmed up to whatever the conversation is going to be in the face-to-face -face class. It can be an extension of how the discussions started in the class. We know that discussions can take amazing and, and fascinating turns. And sometimes, you know, the class ends and it, it, go, it comes so fast that you're never able to have as much closure. So it can be an opportunity to go online and continue the conversation to bring in more ideas and elements to further ex, uh, explore. But all that to say, all of that is to say, you know, digital discussions have a role in your class, and it's worth thinking about what that role is. Once you are making the decision that you want to have a dis, you know a digital discussion in your course, it really is important to think about what is its role and its purpose. What is it serving in terms of students' learning and the value to their experience? And as you move from there, it's important to think about, well, what do they need to do? What is the expectation? What is the, what am I asking them to do to, to engage in a discussion? Because we have, you know, we have discussion or we have this term discussion in the general larger cultural sense where it means, you know, people just kind of enter in and out of, of talking and they do so willingly. But all 
almost all discussions in a course are not uh, natural. They are, they're kind of a structured feature. So there's a certain amount of artifice to discussions. They don't necessarily happen naturally. So then helping students understand what they are doing, what they're getting out of it, the way it connects to their course are all important pieces. Uh, behavioral expectations are an important piece. Helping students to understand what's, you know, what what level of interaction is expected what how should they be thinking about their presentation of information you know behavioral expectations norm setting whatever the term we want to use we often do this in our courses trying to understand and come to an agreement of how do we show up in this space and how do we uh, anticipate or interact with others but you also might want to think about other things like discussion sizes how big or small do you want the discussion to be? One of the challenges is that the bigger the discussion, if you know, if you have a class of 15, there's going to be people that feel it's harder to to get into the discussion. Um, it may they may feel like, well, you know, those three or four students who always chime up have already gone in and posted four different things. I don't have anything to add. So there's, you know, there's some considerations of do you start with smaller discussions, you know, three groups of five, uh, and allow them to have their smaller discussions and then bring it to the to the larger class as a whole. Um, and there are ways you can certainly do this within Moodle. You might also think about being clear about what your strategy is if you are participating in the discussion. I do think it's important and valuable for students, for faculty to be involved in the discussion, but I think they also need to be very clear about what they are doing in the discussion and explain that at the beginning. And I say this because if you go in as the instructor and you respond to three or four students, it may not be entirely clear. Does that mean the like? Does that mean that thread is done? That you have chimed in, and that just like that that thread of conversation is over. Uh, does it mean that you know those those students you responded to did well, and those that you didn't uh, didn't respond to didn't do well? So really, being clear, being transparent about what it means to show up to the discussion in a course. Um, again, these are often text-based discussions, which means it can be very hard for stu for students to read into what it is that you're writing. So anything you can do to kind of contextualize that and help them understand. It's always important to just, you know, to be clear about how the discussion fits into the context of that week's learning. And sometimes it may not. It may be you're setting up this discussion for something that's happening next week. Uh, maybe they're discussing their ideas for a project and the next week they're choosing their project. That's fine. You just want to make sure it's clear and connect those dots. Make those dots explicit. Don't just assume that you know, therefore they know, but really draw out those lines. Another thing is if you have students engaging in a discussion every week for eight weeks or 16 weeks of your course, uh, and the idea is that they are supposed to, you know, post, you know, a 250, a 250 word response followed by two 150 word replies. I'm just throwing those numbers out there. That I've seen them used a lot. Um, if you're asking them to do that, I mean, you're ultimately asking them like each week to basically write two pages. Um, so if it's an eight week course, that's 16 pages. If it's a 16 week course, that's 32 pages of writing. And for some instructors, you may only be asking of, you know, you may be saying, oh, those 32 pages counts as participation. And that's only 10% or 15% of your grade. Uh, that feels like a a miscalculation in terms of the the ask of the student the time and it is different from face to face right and face to face students don't all necessarily have to participate or participate to that degree of 250 words they can often say 50 words and you will see like oh yeah they contributed they've made a meaningful contribution so really being mindful of that and thinking about how much the discussion, how much work is asked in the discussion and how much uh, the the reward is or the, just the, the recognition of their effort. And then finally, thinking about having clear evaluative tools. That's both, you know, a clear expectation or a clear sense of what they should have in post, as well as I often find rubrics are useful in just clarifying what is, you know, where are the, the emphases points and, you know, what are the levels of, um, 
performance that you were expecting. You may not want to use a rubric. You may instead decide to include, uh, you know, great examples of discussion posts and examples that need work. But what you really want to do is make sure it's clear to them how you're looking at them through, like how you're going to analyze them and, and give them feedback on it. So that's during, or that's that's anticipating. That's when you're initially building out what you want to do with a discussion. But once you've got the discussions up and running, um, or, or as you're thinking about them during the course, there's a couple other things to be thinking about. The first is making sure they have a low stakes opportunity to, like, try this out before they you know, before more significant. Uh, contributions and I will recommend this till the cows come home any technology any kind of thing you're doing in a course you always want the low stakes opportunity first allow them to do something so they get familiar with the actual technology or the process and then allow them to kind of you know do it again but or, or give them that that next step where they are actually digging in to the the actual concept. So one is just to learn how to do it. The next is them actually really doing it and delving into the ideas that you're wanting them to play with. So intro discussions are a great way to to get them comfortable and using or, or thinking about um, how to use the discussion. And you can use that intro discussion to do several different useful things. You can have them state what they know or don't know or want to learn about the given course, the given subject. Uh, you can ask them to solve a challenge or briefly research a, a relevant topic that's interesting interesting to them and relevant to the course. And you can also ask them things like how they plan to integrate the course into their busy lives. I really like this one because students get to see one another's strategies. They may pick up tips or ideas about how they, they can do certain things um, or how, you know, how different people operate. All of that's great. The other thing about the intro discussion is that whatever you have in here, that can often be useful and helpful for your one-on-one -on -one meetings to draw upon and to kind of have a stronger sense of who the student is. Other things, and this is more like throughout the the entire semester, is really making sure you reply um, with questions to nudge, right? So, not necessarily replying to a student and saying they did it wrong, but using questioning, using uh, you know, using that as a means of trying to elicit more, because it's important. It's important and it can be very, we can fall into the strap of the student doesn't do it the exact way I anticipated and therefore they did it wrong versus in, in that deficit lens is not necessarily helpful to anyone versus approaching it with a more asset based lens of, well, they did it in the way that they, they understood. And if there's a disconnect there, then I can probably find more out from them by asking some questions and giving a little bit of that nudge. Now, when asking questions, the important thing is to be clear about who you were asking questions of. And this goes back to that idea about being clear about your role as the instructor in the course. If you're going to ask questions of the student who, whose post you're replying to, make that clear. You know, do something like, oh, Amy, I liked how you said X, but I'm not understanding why. Can you elaborate? So you have those types of questions, but you also may want to raise questions that other people answer. So you might also be in that same uh, thread, in that same response saying, you know, hey everyone, Amy had this really cool idea, you know, idea A, and I remember Rob also had this idea B. So for everybody, I'm curious, what do you think when we add A and B together? Right, so this, the idea here is, is really making it clear, using clear language of who you're asking the question of, making sure people know who is expected to respond. Uh, because there certainly can be a lack of clarity there and confusion about, is this a general question, is this a specific question? Strategically replying across the class, you know, this makes a lot of sense. This is really helpful to build your relationships with different students. One of the other things I actually do is in that first week, in that intro discussion, all in a, any course I teach, all students get video replies to their introduction. And I don't make them long. There may be a minute, minute and a half. And I just, I use that moment to really connect with, emphasize, respond to what the student has posted. It helps to validate and let them know that I see them and also give them a sense of who I am, give them a sense of my, you know, quirkiness and goofiness and whatnot. And then also, I think it's important to remind students during the week when you're, uh, when there are due dates related to the discussion. So, 
you know, sometimes I have, you know, your po your initial posts are due by Thursday, your replies are due by Wednesday. And send out, you know, I set up Moodle so that those reminders go out every week. And I want that there for my students. I want them to be nudged to, to have that reminder. Saying, well, I put it in the course, I put it in the syllabus is easy, but there's so much information that for me, giving everybody an extra nudge, I know gets a better return and is more appreciated than just assuming, oh, there it is, it's there, you know, if they don't touch it, they obviously don't want to, or assigning any kind of negative attribute. I just assume that, you know, it's helpful because I certainly know for myself, it's extremely helpful when I get my notifications for uh, that I set up in my own calendar. And then finally, it's sometimes fun and useful to throw an announced curveball. So throwing out to the students midweek or mid discussion that like, oh, I'm adding this to the discussion. I want people to kind of, you know, play around with this. And sometimes that happens because there's uh, current events that come in and play that key role. Other times it's you just happen to realize, oh, you know, the discussion isn't going the way I wanted or it's not really being as lively as I wanted. Let me add this extra piece. In either case, when you do that, you know, you can send it out via the announcement tool. Make sure you're clear that if students already responded to it, you know, are they re required to create a new post? And generally, I would say no, um, but really encouraging people to kind of say, oh, like there's something new um, that, you know, a new direction that the discussion is taking. Another extension of this is also, you know, if you're, you're following the discussion, and by like day three or four, there's one or two really good responses doing an announcement and saying, oh my gosh, you know, Jose and Marie's point were, were really fascinating. And I think they're taking the conversation in a whole new direction. Like just by putting that out into an announcement can get students attention. And now they're going back to that discussion thinking about, oh, there's something else going on here. And then finally, instructor strategies after the discussion. The first is really important, provide prompt feedback. Um, if you have a discussion going each week, you really want to make sure you have feedback to students before, they, before the midpoint or before the post that students need to do for the next discussion, right? So if the discussion ends on Sunday, they have to post their first post in the next week's discussion by Thursday, you want that feedback to them by Wednesday or early Thursday at the latest because how are they supposed to know how to improve if they're doing something egregiously wrong or they're missing certain points about how to do the discussion, how are they supposed to improve upon that if they don't have that feedback? So that's something to keep in mind. Sometimes I've seen instructors let feedback go on discussions and that does two things. One, it doesn't help students and it also communicates and discussions aren't as important or as valid. And so students will also continue to give less and less to it because I'm not even getting feedback on this. Why do I even invest time in it? And then we also have making sure to wrap up the, the highlights of the week. And you can do this, you know, in writing, you can do this as a video or a podcast. You can also, as part of the discussion assignment or participation assignment, have a student or delegate a student to be that wrapper upper. Um, and you might do this, you know, in a, in a stage fashion where each week it's two students who share, you know, how they see the arc of the conversation. That's really cool because it gives you two different perspectives. It helps those students with their note taking skills and synthesizing skills, and it provides potentially two interesting takes that the other students will find that the other the other students may find interesting. You also, as you know, I mentioned this a little bit in the the during, but really want to make sure you highlight strong contributions. Make sure you give public credit to um, the ways people are showing up and contributing to the conversation. You want to spread that obviously across all students. Um, and whenever possible, connect it to the past, uh, back to the previous week and make it serve as a bridge to the present week. So, oh, we had this rich conversation that really helped us understand X last week and it prepares us to look at Y this week. All right, so what are other tips and strategies that you have? I would love to hear from folks. Um, you can actually send them as an email if you are watching this. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can add it into the comments feature. And I would love to hear what other things you would add. And I will certainly add these to our resources for uh, having discussions and strategies around what to do before, during, and after. All right. 
Now I want to take a, a, a move into talking about types of discussions. Because one of the things that's most challenging around discussions is in online courses over the last 30 years, they, they seem to have boiled down into what feels like the most, um, I don't know, the most watered down version of a discussion that really does it doesn't often fulfill anybody. It, it starts to feel a bit like busy work. And that is the typical one, and it's number one here, the, the reflect and respond, where you know you as a student respond you, you post your thoughts on the prompt. So you have that initial post and then you have two replies to peers. And there's something very unorganic about it. There's something very unexciting about it. It doesn't really uh, resonate with what we mean when we use discussions, right? We, there's ways we, you know, in the, 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 in the world at large, when we talk about discussions, we often are thinking things that are lively, interactive, back and forth. And then there's discussions that we have in online courses, and those just feel like very lackluster, very, um, you know, very dull spaces to be in. So in lieu of that, what I have is a bunch of like one or two of those may be fine, but if that's all eight weeks of the course, that can sometimes just really wear. Uh, and I've certainly seen it. Like by the time you get to the second half of the course, it just feels rote to many students. And, it, you know, as a student, I found that to be the case. But there's lots of other ways you can think about discussions and play around. Um, one is the answer and ask tag. And so this is very much like uh, when when people were in, you know, when you're in a Zoom room and they talk about the popcorn method, where you, in this case, you could do it two ways. You can start with a person asks a question or the instructor creates the initial prompt and student one replies and then they tag whoever the next person they want to answer the question, right? So you can do it that way. The other way that you can do it is you can actually start with one question and student A answers it, and then they tag somebody else with another question, a question relevant to the course, but a question um, of their own choosing. And each student goes through. And one thing about this is it is a little more time consuming. So it's not something you would do over the course of a week. Um, it is probably something you need to do over a course of two or three weeks. And that's fine. Discussions don't necessarily have to pair up of every, uh, every week it being a discussion with that particular week. You can look at it more expansively than that. And there's a few other options that play with that. Uh, you can uh, also use the apply that to this. And of course, that's where, as you're introduced to course concepts, going out into the world and finding examples, um, but it's also playing around with developing useful metaphors or uh, analogies and having students work through uh, or having students try to come up with as they encounter an idea, what is a useful analogy to use that, to understand or to communicate that idea. Um, this can be really good for people that are thinking about, you know, that, that you want people um, who may be looking to teach or helping them just understand that by them using the metaphors, it, it allows them to start to think about teaching content, which often is where I know for many of us, we learned a lot when we start to teach something. There's the gallery walk where you have students create some kind of media. It could be a video, it could be an image or a photo that they take. It could be a sound recording, but there's some kind of creative act and students go to each student's post of that creative act and provide feedback or provide thoughts or, you know, critical, uh, you know, critical uh, reflection on and the like. There's the guest moderator. And this is, of course, you know, you bring somebody into Moodle to actually come up, maybe come up with the prompt and engage students around that particular topic. So it could be somebody that is deep in the field. It could be a, you know, a celebrity or a well-known person in the, the work that you're doing. It could be the author of a book that you're reading. Um, but really think about bringing somebody in and therefore it becoming something different, right? That guest moderator, it could be a and a with them or a uh, ask me anything kind of set up. I really like the questions approach. You know, I'm inspired by Warren Berger's work and the Right Question Institute and this idea of it's not just about, you know, being able to uh, 
demonstrate your learning or ideas, but really also coming up with powerful questions. And so in this case, you can, you know, the goal isn't to have good posts, but have uh, have students generate good questions and have them give feedback on each other's questions or, you know, improve upon their questions. So round one might be, you know, come up with 15 questions or 20 questions that you would want to ask of um, this person or 20 questions that you would ask the text that we just read. And then the replies could be either answering some of those questions or it could be uh, expanding or you know further deliberating or further ex expanding or further um, creating more questions or providing some you know for some feedback on the quality of the questions asked so it could be a really rich way of getting getting into some nuanced considerations the role play and roles playing are two of my favorite and I've used them and I've seen them used in really cool ways so the role play is <clears throat> Very simply, you come up with a, a role play and every student does the same role play. So for instance, in one of the courses I taught, uh, one week we were looking at censorship and horror comics in the 1950s. And so I had students, they all, the, the role they were playing was that they were part of the Comics Code Authority and they had to evaluate three horror comics and talk about, you know, whether or not it lived up to the code of the, the Comics Code of the time, which was a very restrictive code about what could and couldn't be in comic books. And then they had to, they were writing this to their supervisor. And so they had to say whether the comics were approved or not. And they also had to say whether they were going to stay with the job or not. And they would, you know, and why they were staying with the job or not. So it was this interesting opportunity to really get them to think about the rich context of the 1950s and horror comics and censorship um, in a way that just asking them about it wouldn't necessarily have gained the same response. The roles playing is similar in that you're still coming up with some kind of rich scenario. But in this case, it's not everybody is in the same role, but different people take on different roles. One of the best examples I've seen of this is a colleague of mine who uh, had students take on different roles of the soil. It was, a it was a horticulture class. They took on the different roles of the soil and each week they would be sharing how they were interacting with the other people, with the other uh, characters in the soil as they went through the semester and as the season changed because it was the spring semester. So you go from winter to spring. Really, really cool and complex way of getting students to engage and interact with one another in a playful manner. Small to large is really great. It's this idea of, you know, we do this in face to face where we do like a think pair share. Well, you do it very similarly of you might have a small group of two or three people have a discussion for the first week. Then you might bring it to, you know, groups uh, to half the class, you know, uh, two groups of eight. And then the third week you might bring it to, you know, the full class. And each time you're bringing in a larger each time you're kind of synthesizing and sharing or, you know, discussing where the similarities and differences and in, in where that discussion went. You can also have that student facilitator and that student facilitator can play that role of both coming up with a rich prompt, facilitating and playing the role of the instructor during the week and then also doing the wrap up. Um, and you can set that up, you know, throughout the course so that several different students are doing it and really building on um, or, or really helping to run and push the conversation. And then finally, the last one I'll recommend, and these, this isn't the, this isn't the, you know, the, the end all be all list, but these are some of the ones I've seen and are used that I think are really cool to explore and would encourage you to play around with. Um, the last one is the ongoing conversation. And what I like about this one is it kind of, you know, re resets our whole understanding of discussions online. And it says, wait a minute, wait a minute, why why are we starting a new conversation each week, right? We've all had this experience or we see this happen where week one, you have a discussion. Week two, a new discussion starts and you never turn to week one's discussion or its points, etc. Same thing happens week three. Like it's, these are these isolated, self-contained discussions that don't often, you know, feel as fulfilling or feel as natural as an actual conversation. And so in this, in this framework, what you would do is you might come up with, you know, three to, three to five really strong 
almost universal prompts about the course. They could be like the big ideas of your course just turned into questions. And the goal is for students to come back each week and re-engage with that question and re-engage with other people's responses in relation to what are the new things that they're learning or discovering or exploring around the course content. And so this can get really cool, it can get really nuanced. Um, it is a little bit different and can have its own you know, unique challenges, but it is a, it's a really different way to think about having a conversation with students and having it in a way that really is both organic and reflects real interest in growth in students over the semester. All right. So those, this is this was all been around the idea of having a discussion in a place like Moodle in the forum tool. But I also want to toss out there, you know, we talk about discussion and, and this idea of like, when is a discussion not a discussion? And, and how might you envision interaction and engagement among students, the instructor, and the learning content differently? And how do you have students learn from one another or push one another? And I ask this because discussions are, are useful, but there's other ways we can actually stimulate interaction among students and create community in an online course without necessarily doing that traditional forum tool. So let's take a look at a couple of them. The first one I call phone a friend and I'll do this usually two or three times in the semester where I'll pair students up and you know they have one or two weeks, typically two weeks to organize a half hour chat. And I give them some, a little bit of a, a, like an outline of the things that they should cover or the questions that they can ask one another uh, and also encourage them to take it organically from there. But the idea is that they actually get on the phone or get on a Zoom call and interact with one another uh, and learn a bit more about what each other is doing and learn about uh, what they're learning and how they're making sense of, of the course. And then sometimes, often I'll have students write up their own reflections of that as a, as a submission or a follow-up. The other is doing an annotated discussion. And so often I'll use something like a Google Drive or a Google Doc. And in a, for instance, in, a literature in literature courses that I teach, I will take a, uh, a written document and I will put it into Google Docs and then I will share that with students and, and the goal is for them to have a conversation around the text by highlighting and commenting on that. And while I'm talking about it as literature, like you could do this in lots of different fields. You could do it in, you know, a business management course where you have students who, you know, you, you pull up a contract of one, a vendor contract or, or some kind of document that requires a bit of scrutiny and have students go to town, have them, you know, highlight and annotate and really share what their thoughts are on the language, on the way it's set up, all of those things. Um, so I do that in Google Drive with Google Docs, but you can also use Hypothesis or Perusal. Those are both popular and useful tools. You can have an ongoing chat and this can be a little bit more informal but it still can produce learning, right? So you can have that on Slack or group G chat or WhatsApp. And it's this idea of you're all together there and you can share regular things and you can also throw out questions and those can be deep or complex questions that you just kind of let people run with. And it's, it's more about kind of continually engaging with them than it is so much about have they, you know, have they participated in the ways that I expected. Um, so I would encourage thinking about what might that look like if it's just this ongoing chat um, that is, you know, whether through an app or or a website or what have you that they can kind of jump in and out as makes sense to them. There's also social media chats that you might have. So you could do this as like hashtag oriented or create like a list or a group or something like that. You could do this on Twitter, even though, you know, at times Twitter can be a dumpster fire. Um, if you have students huddled around a particular hashtag, um, I've certainly seen lots of rich and amazing conversations happen through hashtags and in, in, in these different pockets in Twitter. Um, you can have it as a group within one of these spaces so that people are able to bring in um, or share content that's already on some of these social media platforms. Um, so it's an, these are ideas that you could kind of play around with and think, does that make sense for the type of course that you're teaching? And then finally, there's voice threads. 
in voice threads. Um, we don't have it yet. At, we, we, it's, it's a tool I'll be exploring more, but voice threads is one of these tools that's just a really cool interactive way of taking media of any sort and allowing for students to have a time, have a conversation around it in a way that includes their own video and their own uh, sound. And that sounds vague, and that's probably the best way I can describe it without getting into rich details. But just know that there's lots of other tools out there. VoiceThreads is one of those exa is an example of those tools where um, you can do some really cool and wild things and spur conversation in ways that are that go beyond just text. All right, so those are the different ways of thinking about the discussion. We're going to move now into actually building out the discussion itself. Um, so let's jump over to Moodle. All right, so here we are back in Moodle. Uh, I'm in my sandbox. And of course, the first thing I always have to do if I'm going to create anything is to come up here to edit mode and turn it on. Once I'm in here, you know, I decide where do I want to have that discussion. I decide I'm going to have it I'm going to add that discussion here. So I'll go to add an activity or resource. And then I will select the forum tool. And once here, of course, I have to provide some, some basic information. I need to give the forum a name. So I'm going to uh, name it yet another amazing discussion. The description is where I would put the instructions, the guidance, the information, you know, all those usual things. And um, notice again, I have that HTML editor toolbar. So that means I could put in images. I could put in a, vi a short video of myself explaining what they need to do. Um, I could pull in links, all of those things. I can put all of that in there. And then we come to forum type and it provides us with several forum types. The two ones that I'm going to strongly recommend or that are a lot of these, there's not much distinction and you may find value in them and you can always click on the little question mark here to have a breakdown of what they are. But the two that I, I strongly recommend is the standard form uh, for general use and that's just your typical straightforward uh, discussion form or the Q&A form. The Q&A form is really cool because what it allows you to do is once you create it and once you create an initial post, students can go in and they can only see other people's posts after they reply. So if you are the fifth student to go into a, dis a discussion that is a Q&A form and there are four replies in there. You won't actually see those four replies until you post a reply yourself. It's essentially they have to pay to play. They have to share their thoughts before they see other people's thoughts. And I think this is a really useful tool. It allows for students to go in and kind of give it a fresh, like here's my thinking, and not necessarily get overwhelmed or get too influenced by what other students are saying. And sometimes you can go in and if there's eight, nine, ten responses already, you may feel like, what do I have to offer? The Q&A form allows for that student to really just go in, give it their, th you know, give their thoughts and then start to see what other students see. Uh, so I think there's some really great learning opportunities there. Availability, uh, it offers us two things, a due date and a cutoff date. So due date is when it is due and that will show up in students' calendars and, and other notification places. Cutoff date is when they can no longer make contributions. I always recommend having a due date. I don't often recommend having a cutoff date. If you're gonna do the due date, I strongly recommend the due date is when their first post is due. So if if you wanted them to have their first post by Thursday in a week and their replies by Sunday, the due date I would use for their post is when their initial post is due. And then I'll talk later on about when you can signal for them for their replies to be done. So that's availability. Attachments and word count, you may want them, you may have them sharing, you know, as I mentioned in the gallery walk, you may have them sharing uh, visuals or content. So you may want to think about, okay, then I should allow them to have attachments. And if it's video, well, maybe those are, you know, those might be bigger. So maybe I want them 50 megabytes. Um, or it's, you know, you have them showing slide decks and depending on the type of slide deck, those could get, you know, pretty high. Um, so you can adjust that as you need or think is relevant. 
Displaying word count, um, I'm increasingly less a fan of having a required word count for discussions, but if I'm going to require a word count, then I want to turn this on. If I require, if, I, if you're requiring students to do something, you want to make it as clear and as easy for them to meet that. And so having a displayed word count helps them know, have I reached the amount of words I need to yet? So I'm going to, I would, if I would, if that was the case, I would select yes. Under subscription and tracking, you don't really need to use or touch this much. Um, by default, it, it, go, it goes to uh, optional subscription, which means students can choose if they subscribe. Subscribe means that they will get an email or, um, or app notification when somebody has done something either in the discussion or in a particular thread. I'm going to skip discussion locking and post thread uh, post threshold for blocking. I don't think those are necessarily those are not necessarily useful unless you are using discussions in a particular way that is and usually at a particular level of like hundreds of people and the like. So I'm gonna I'm gonna leave those alone for now. Whole form grading. This is if you are going to grade them and you would select points. You would identify what's the maximum grade they can get for a discussion, and then choose the grading method. In this case, you would choose simple grading means you can just put in a numerical amount. You know, you got 100 or you got 95%, and then you would be, be, a lot, be able to give comments. Marking guide and rubric are very similar. Rubric is a little more rigid in that you have the different categories in which they're being evaluated and the different levels. And the level that you assign, so if you had like expert, uh, you know, moderate, moderately uh, good, uh, fair, what, you know, you had those different categories. And you assigned, you know, the, the expert gets, 50, you know, 30 points, the good gets uh, 25 points, the fair gets 20 points. That, is, that number is fixed. You can't adjust that whatsoever. It is, if, if, they get, uh, if they get expert, then they get the full 30 points. Marking guide is, you, have the, you might have those categories of like, you will have the, the criteria rather of, you know, maybe it's content, uh, syntax, and argument you can assign how much points each of those are and then you can delegate if if it's 50 points for argument you can choose anywhere between 0 and 50 to award so rubrics are a little more rigid in terms of whatever the point is uh, whatever the point value is of that particular square, then that is the that is the only score score they can get. Marking guide, you can kind of play around with the full range of points within a given uh, area of evaluation. The rest of this you can largely leave um, untouched. Ratings you can leave untouched. It's a remnant of a previous version of discussions in Moodle. Common Moodle settings. Uh, again, you can always hide this if, if you're not done with it and you want to give it a little more time or you don't want students to see it yet. You can ignore ID number and then group mode. This is really cool that within discuss you can create discussions and you can create groups. And so in a discussion, you can have different groups have different discussions. So if it is a separate group, that means if you have group A and group B, They'll be participating in the same discussion, but they won't see each other's posts. So student or a student in group A will respond only to other students in group A and won't even see group B. Visible groups will be you can see the other group, but you can't interact with them, right? So I could see students in group B and what they're posting, but I can't actually add to their conversation. So it's just useful to think about and be aware of um, if you want to use groups that you can play around with which version you would want them to, uh, you know, do you want them to see one another's uh, work and the like. All right, moving on to restrict access. Um, if you want to create any any levels or anything they need to do before they can access this, you might use restrict access. Um, it might be something as simple as like reading the guidelines or, you know, um, watching the video or something like that. Activity completion, I really, I do like with, uh, with Moodle because it gives me a couple different options here. The first thing I like to do is have it 
automatically marked as complete when conditions are met rather than students having to do it. And the conditions that I can include are in that I like our student must view this activity, right? We want them to view it. That's definitely important. And I usually skip over grade and I focus in this area of required posts, required discussions and replies. So this first option is they either need posts or replies and then you put the number in here. So I could say three and that means they need either three, any mixture of posts and replies that amount to three. So it could be one post and two replies, it could be three replies, it could be two posts and one reply, any of any mixture, so long as ultimately they've made three contributions to the discussion. But if I want to do it a little bit differently, I might require that they must create at least one discussion and they must post at least three replies. And in the in the thing that in what we're looking at right now or the the Q and A discussion, we probably wouldn't be able to do it this way. We would probably want to do it more like this. That they I, I would leave it default to this. But just know that you have some options to play around with. And then finally, expected completed on when they should they be done with this. So if you remember up here when we were looking at the due date, I said the initial use this for the initial post of when it's due. The expected to be completed on date you can also use here. And this is where you can say this is when their reply should be done by. So if their post is due by Thursday, I'd, I'd set up the due date for Thursday. If their replies are due on Sunday, then I'd set the replies for Sunday. And that's a nice way of making sure that in their calendars, in their notifications, they still get a sense of when the different pieces are done. All right, so those are all the options, all the things we need to cover in the discussion. We can now do save and display. And as you can see, I've already completed the first task, which is to view the discussion. Um, and now I still need to do is make three forum posts. All right. Um, here is the instructions or the instructions that we would have had. And now I'm just going to add a discussion post because this is the Q&A forum, that forum where students can only reply. Um, you actually do have to create an initial post. <coughs> And, you know, you have your text in here, add some information and post a form. If I don't do this, then when students come in, they'll have no way that they can engage in the conversation. They have, if you're using the Q&A forum type, then you have to actually create a post. And I'll show you with that as we move in, I'll show you that from the student point of view. So I'll come in as student and in here as student, notice that I do not have an add a discussion topic. It's a Q&A form and therefore that means I have to be, I have to reply to a post that's already there and it's the instructor that has to actually um, provide that post. So if I go in, now I can reply and contribute to the conversation. All right, that is the how to build the discussion forum. I'm hoping that makes sense. I'm hoping that's clear on how to do that. There's an, um, but I think more importantly, I'm hoping the first two thirds of this were really helpful in getting you to understand the different types of conversations, the different ways conversations uh, and discussions can really happen in this digital space and enhance uh, teaching and learning for our students. So I hope you have, uh, I hope this is helpful. And if you have questions, I look forward to hearing from, from you. Thank you so much.